Welcome to the Longmont Museum on the Internet. My name is Justin Veach. I'm the manager of the museum's Stewart Auditorium. And this evening, we are not coming at you live and direct from the Stewart Auditorium. We're coming at you live and direct from our respective homes. And that is due to us taking an abundance of caution in light of recent uh, increases in COVID cases around these here parts. Uh, tonight's program is being offered as part of our Thursday nights at the museum series. Every Thursday night throughout this fall, we've been providing folks with free programs uh, from panels, lectures, conversations to readings and author events. Um, just lots of stuff. This is the uh, this is the last of two programs. We've got one left after this. Uh, next week, we'll have a conversation with Eric Mason, the museum's curator of history, on his new book, Longmont 150. That's right, he's written the book on Longmont. And uh, that'll, that, that's going to be released in collaboration with an upcoming exhibition uh, that we have on uh, celebrating 150 years of Longmont. Um, our next, pro the program after that is a special holiday show. It's our annual holiday show. It's our, but this year it's going to be a little different. We're calling it the Holiday Show Webathon edition, and that's on Saturday, December 5th. Uh, it's going to be an all day affair. I'm going to be channeling uh, my inner Jerry Lewis to kind of present a, uh, a kind of classic telethon style program with a dozen different musical acts, uh, some of your favorite from around Longmont, including Longmont Symphony Orchestra, Clandestine Amigo, and more. You'll want to tune into that uh, for some holiday cheer and to support the Longmont Museum. I want to thank everyone who makes these programs possible, our museum members, our donors, the friends of the Longmont Museum, the Scientific, Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, aka SCFD, and our media sponsor, KGNU out of Boulder. This evening's program, Catcher in the Sky, Tales of Modern Day Science, Research, and Aviation, is presented in collaboration with the National Center for Atmos Atmospheric Researches, at, aka NCAR, Discovery Series, and the City of Longmont's Sustainability Program. A little bit about the sustainability program, in case you're interested. In 2016, Longmont adopted a sustainability plan, which lays out a roadmap for creating a sustainable and thriving future for all. With active engagement and partnership with all sectors of Longmont's community, the city is striving to meet ambitious goals over the next 10 years to support environmental stewardship, economic vitality, and social equity. The sustainability plan also supports and complements the guiding principles of Envision Longmont, a multimodal and comprehensive plan that will provide strategic direction and guidance for Longmont over the next 10 to 20 years. The sustainability plan identifies activities in 10 primary topic areas, including air quality, the natural environment, and water, all of which, of course, are pertinent to, to this evening's program. Clouds provide fresh water and shade and are critical to life as we know it. Amidst the beautiful landscapes of clouds in the sky exist physical and chemical processes that play an incredibly important and complex role in the Earth's climate system. To tell us a little more about their work studying such processes, we have Christina McCluskey and Scotty McLean with us here this evening. Christina McCluskey is a project scientist in the Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory at NCAR. In this capacity, she studies the microscopic interactions between atmospheric particles and clouds. Her research is motivated by a need to better understand clouds, which are one of the most challenging and uncertain aspects of the Earth's climate system. One of the main areas in which Christina focuses her research is the Southern Ocean, one of the windiest and cloudiest places on Earth. Clouds over the Southern Ocean are important for our climate system because they reflect a lot of the sun's energy back to space, yet our physical understanding of these clouds is limited. Christina uses both observations and numerical modeling tools, as we'll see, to study these processes. She earned her PhD from Colorado State University in 2017, came to NCAR as a postdoctoral fellow in the Advanced Study Program, she has spent many hours observing clouds and particles from planes, ships, and research stations around the world, which affords her the opportunity to collaborate with scientists from around the world. 
about Scotty McLean. Scotty is the NCAR chief pilot for the Earth Observing Laboratory's research aviation facility. He has been at NCAR since 2008 after retiring from the United States Air Force. He flies both the Gulfstream 5 and Lockheed Martin C-130 aircrafts. Since joining NCAR, McLean has flown over 30 atmospheric research field projects around the world, enabling scientists from NCAR and many universities to gain a better understanding of our dynamic and ever-changing environment. These project flights have required operations in a variety of challenging conditions, such as convection, icing, turbulence, and low altitude flight. Please welcome Chris Christina McCluskey and Scotty McLean to the virtual Longmont Museum. Thank you, Justin. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We are gonna get situated here, hopefully. Okay, thank you, Justin, for that very kind introduction. And I wanna thank the NCAR Explorer Series team and also the team at Longmont Museum for hosting us today. Um, the title of our talk, as Justin mentioned, is Catcher in the Sky, a Tale of Modern Day Science, Research, and Aviation. And I'm very happy to be here with Scotty McLean, um, one of our many pilots, um, very talented pilots, and working with a scientist and, and getting our science done. I'm going to start our presentation tonight with an image of our Earth from space. And I love this image um, because from this perspective, the atmosphere appears as this very thin um, blue line. It almost seems you know, unamusing and, and unimportant. But in fact, no matter where you live on Earth, this atmosphere, this thin blue line, protects you from the sun, it provides oxygen, it allows us to circulate water, um, and, and really um, enables life on Earth as we know it. And here at NCAR, we really research and we, we focus on the atmosphere and the Earth system. And the purpose of that research is to really understand and, and preserve the atmosphere um, in this thin blue line. And one thing I hope you take away from this talk is that um, this presentation um, will have some science, but it will also hopefully be very clear that um, the science that we do requires an incredible amount of collaboration um, in, in order to improve our understanding of the Earth system. Um, so Scotty and I represent two um, components of that community, but in fact there are engineers, software engineers, technicians, um, and, and very supportive and incredible administrative teams. Um, and so we wouldn't be here without them. Today we're going to talk about what is a cloud, um, why are clouds so complicated, um, what are the roles of clouds in our climate, and we're going to talk and have a sort of virtual tour um, of what it's like using our flying laboratory um, here at NCAR. And then finally, um, as Scotty mentioned, I, or excuse me, as Justin mentioned, um, I, I care a lot about Southern Ocean clouds, so we're going to definitely talk about some Southern Ocean research that we've been doing. Okay, so what is a cloud? Um, atmospheric particles or aerosol particles, um, they serve as cloud condensation nuclei. So in this cartoon, I have these um, particles that um, are these cubes here, and these are actually um, serving as a seed for condensate to um, grow into uh, liquid cloud droplets. So these atmospheric particles can come from a series of um, of, of sources. We have dust sources, smoke, which um, those of us in Colorado are far too familiar with this year, um, pollution, agriculture, sea spray, aerosol. There, there are numerous sources of particles in the atmosphere. So this allows us to form our liquid clouds. So again, these atmospheric particles serve as cloud condensation nuclei to form these liquid cloud droplets. But we know that, especially here in Colorado, we like to get lots of snow. And so we know that ice is also present in these clouds. So at lower temperatures, um, we do have ice. And I want you to be honest with yourself and answer this question. At what temperature do you think a pure clear, or excuse me, a pure cloud droplet freeze? Um, so at what point will this liquid cloud droplet actually form an ice crystal? So think to yourself, what temperature do you think that would be? And as you think about that, I'm going to show you a video um, this was filmed back in February, and this is a, a Nalgene water bottle that has tap water in it that was left overnight back in February, so it was really cold. And you'll notice at the beginning of this movie that there is liquid inside of this water bottle, and all I do is shake it, and you can see that the bottle completely glaciates, and this actually forms a massive ice cube. And this process is known as ice nucleation, where the 
liquid that's inside of that Nalgene bottle is actually super cool. So it's super cool liquid and it needs to interact with the surface or in this case I shook it and so it was able to um, get into some sort of crack um, or maybe even um, some other imperfection that's in the tap water that then allowed it to freeze. And so really the answer to this question at what temperature can a pure cloud droplet freeze is minus 20 or excuse me wow minus 40 degrees celsius. Um, so at minus 40 degrees Celsius, we have homogeneous freezing, and that's where our cloud droplets can form ice crystals. And these are our ice clouds. And in between these two temperatures, so from zero to minus 40 degrees Celsius, is our mixed phase clouds. And this is where things get much more complicated. We can still form cloud droplets that are now super cooled at these temperatures, um, through the same pathway as in our warm liquid clouds. In order to form ice crystals in this mixed phase, regime, we need to have some sort of special particle. So in this case, um, these are ice nucleotide particles. Um, these are special particles that um, have had quite a bit of research to go into um, why these particles are special. Um, one theory is that um, these particles have a surface on them that mimics the shape of ice. So, so you maybe see this as kind of the shape of ice. Um, so in this case, for immersion freezing, that ice nucleotide particle gets immersed into that cloud droplet and once it reaches its freezing temperature, it will form an ice crystal. And these ice nucleating particles can also interact and form ice crystals um, through different pathways as well. So deposition freezing and contact freezing. And the best ice nucleating particle is ice crystals itself. And this process um, called ice multiplication is where once you have an ice crystal present in the cloud, you can actually multiply the, the number of ice crystals in the cloud by those ice crystals interacting with other cloud droplets. So as you can imagine, this is um, very complicated for mixed phase clouds and it gets even better. For ice crystals, ice crystals actually grow very quickly. Um, so this is a, a microscope image of ice crystal. So this is the solid phase and liquid cloud droplets that surround it. And you can imagine that the water vapor is in this gray area between these different um, uh, cloud droplets and ice crystals. And as I go through these images, you can watch and see that the ice crystal grows and the, ice, and the cloud droplets actually get smaller. So I'm gonna go back to the beginning and pay attention to the cloud droplets. These actually get smaller. And this happens on the time scale of minutes or less. Um, and so these ice crystals can form very, very rapidly. So when you think about this and all these things I just talked about, for a liquid phase cloud, over some amount of time, those liquid cloud droplets will grow. And so these, as you start out, over some amount of time, those cloud droplets become larger. For mixed phase clouds, what we see is that the cloud droplets that surround those ice crystals will actually evaporate. And we can even have more ice crystals form either through ice nucleation or that ice multiplication process I talked about. And those two processes combined end up having a profound effect on the cloud's lifetime and the ability to form precipitation. So in this case, this cartoon is showing that over some amount of time, a liquid phase cloud has much less likelihood of forming precipitation like snow and what rain compared to a mixed phase cloud. Um, and so this gets very complicated. Um, and as you can, as you all know, we've all seen hundreds of different types of clouds um, and, and they have different properties like precipitation. And just to give you a very um, dramatic comparison of that, on the left, you'll see the summer thunderstorm, where if you see this, you know, you would expect to see lots of rain, probably even some hail. Um, whereas if you see these cirrus clouds, they're high up in the atmosphere, they're kind of wispy, you wouldn't expect to have any of your outdoor plans ruined, right? So any, on top of them being complicated, depending on where they occur in the atmosphere and many other um, uh, components of atmospheric science can all influence the clouds. Okay, so what is the role of clouds in our climate? Clouds can reflect sunlight. So this is an image of our Earth. This is back from um, March 20th. Um, and you can see that the, there are these bright clouds, these bright white clouds, and these clouds are able to reflect sunlight. Clouds can also insulate the surface with terrestrial radiation. So as the clouds, um, think about on an evening, if it's cloudy, you have a warmer temperature than if it's a clear sky night, right? So those clouds are serving as sort of a blanket to the surface to um, reflect that terrestrial radiation back to the surface. So the clouds form, um, play a very important role in that energy balance and the temperature that we feel experience here at the surface. 
So how do we study this? How do we study how clouds interact with the climate? So we use tools such as the Earth System numerical models. So we have many different types of models, and today I'm going to talk about the Earth System model, which um, includes representations of the entire Earth system. These are based off of our current knowledge and also on our current computing resources. So while we would really love to be able to simulate and represent every single leaf and every single rock, um, you know, that's, that's really not feasible. And so we do make simplifications. Um, and that doesn't, that doesn't end with just rocks and leaves, it's also with clouds, precipitation, and whatnot. And so we, we really work hard on developing these models to make them the best representation um, and that's what we're actively developing and has been going on for many decades. Um, and so this is a cartoon, kind of a joke, but it's true that these, these models really are a lot of Fortran code. Um, it's a lot of equations and data and lookup tables and ways that we're finding to um, represent these different processes. Okay, so clouds actually remain one of the most important challenges in Earth system numerical models and really in Earth system science. Um, so what I'm showing here is a yearly average cloud cover over the, over the globe, um, where you can see warmer colors um, are higher amounts of cloud cover and cooler colors are smaller amounts of cloud cover. Um, so you can see the Western United States here um, doesn't have a very high cloud cover um, com compared to some of the polar regions. When we compare that to satellite observations, where we have amazing tools up in space that um, provide us information for things like clouds. Um, this is the, what we get when we look at the annual average cloud cover from, from our satellite observations. And you can see differences. I mean, there are places where we do um, see similar features where, again, in the Western United States, we still see those lower cloud cover percentages. Um, and same thing with Australia and both. Um, but you can also probably see quite a few differences. And this difference becomes even more pronounced when you think about the phase. So we talked already a lot about the importance of phase. Um, and this is now showing the simulated from our model um, annual average ice clouds. So now we're saying, okay, in the clouds that are simulated, which ones contain ice? And so now again, the warmer colors indicate more cloud cover and then the cooler colors indicate lower cloud cover. And when we compare that to our satellite observations, you can see even more differences. Um, and in particular, um, you can see over the Southern Ocean, that there are massive differences. Um, and so in this model, we actually have far more ice containing clouds compared to satellites. So the satellite observations indicate that there's not actually that many ice clouds in the Southern Ocean, whereas in our model, we have a lot of ice. And so what we know is that in our models, based on our satellite comparisons, is that we have too few clouds and they also contain too much ice. And the Southern Ocean is really special because um, it's really one of the most pristine, cloudy, windy regions on Earth. And because of the challenges that, um, in terms of access and um, the logistics that go into planning field campaigns, um, and, and also sort of a lack of focus in getting, uh, getting down there, um, there are very few observations. And so um, I feel very fortunate to have been down there twice now. Um, and it's just one of, it's a, it's a profound experience because it's somewhere where you're very far removed from land um, and, and including like anthropogenic pollution um, and um, dust. And so it becomes a really interesting place to study cloud microphysics because um, you don't have influences from other sources. You're really kind of in a laboratory of the ocean and the clouds. And so an important thing that we are realizing is that satellites oftentimes are able to penetrate through the entire cloud field, but in some cases, such as over the Southern Ocean, the satellite's perspective may actually be a little skewed, where if you have a really opaque cloud, that satellite signal that's able to penetrate through the clouds normally actually doesn't make it all the way through the cloud. And so we're not able to see properties of the cloud's base, okay? So we've deployed ship campaigns, um, and, and from the ship's perspective, we're able to now look up um, but the same phenomena occurs where that cloud is so optically thick that from the ship's perspective, you also can't get all the way through the entire cloud field. And when we compare the satellite observations for the versus the ship's observations, what we see is when we look at, in this case, the fraction of clouds that are liquid, that's on the y-axis, 
And on the x-axis is temperature. So we're going and decreasing temperature towards the left down to minus 40 degrees Celsius. That's where that homogeneous freezing process occurs. And this is where um, we can have all of our mixed phase clouds. And so this is where we're focusing. And when we compare our satellite observations to our ship observations, in theory, these should line up, but they don't. Um, and so for example, at minus 20 degrees Celsius, we don't know, but somewhere in between 25 and 50% of the clouds that were observed are liquid. Um, and so this is a really big gap in our understanding of the Southern Ocean clouds because it appears as though the information that we do have to help make our models better um, doesn't necessarily provide the entire picture. So this is where we need observations in the clouds. And this is where our flying laboratory is such a vital tool to allow us to move forward in this field. And so we're gonna talk about the Socrates campaign in particular today. The Socrates stands for the Southern Ocean Clouds Radiation Aerosol Transport Experimental Study. Um, and in particular, I was focused on two main goals. First, to characterize the abundance of ice nucleating particles, so the special particles that allow crystals to form in clouds at the mixed phase regime, and also looking at the phase of clouds over the Southern Ocean. And then the second goal is really to evaluate and also improve the clouds that are represented in the Earth system model. So next we're gonna switch gears and I'm gonna pass it off to Scotty. And Scotty is going to talk to us about um, being a pilot for NCAR. Um, and hopefully we can do this pretty smoothly. Thanks, Christina. Sometimes these uh, virtual pr presentations are harder to fly than the airplane is. Okay, I think I got that right. So good evening. As uh, Justin said, my name's Scott McLean. I'm the chief pilot here at NCAR and I've been, uh, been here since 2008. So when the scientists, they come up with these field campaigns, they start with their research goals and they, you know, they want to know what kind of, they want to gather a certain amount of data. So when they, in the beginning phases of this, Christina and her colleagues will come to us at uh, research aviation facility at NCAR and we'll start working with them at early stages to make sure that when they do want to go somewhere that we can make that happen. Before we get into that though, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, NSF NCAR aircraft. We operate two, air two of them. The first one's a C-130 and it flies at 200 nautical miles per hour. In this range, it can reach out to about 2,500 nautical miles. 27,000 feet is about as high as we can go. Obviously though, that depends on gross weight. The C-130 is sort of like a, um, a minivan. It's got a lot of utility. It can, we can hold a lot of instruments and we can hold a lot of people in there. And it's very valuable as a chemistry platform. We can hang a lot of stuff off the wings. We, uh, can, we have a lot of inlets on the aircraft. The G5 on the other hand, that's more like the, uh, the race car. It flies at 460 nautical miles per hour, which is 0.8 Mach at altitude. And if the wings are clean, we can make 5,000 nautical miles pretty easily with it. When Christina wants data gathered, we'll start hanging stuff on the wings and I'll get to that here in a little bit. And that drags it up a good, that, that uh, increases the drag on the aircraft. So that'll cut our range down substantially to about 3,500 nautical miles. The airplane can also reach 51,000 feet if it's light enough. 49,000 feet is usually what we target for research. I wanna give you a little spoiler alert here. This was a, this is a seven hour research mission. We took off out of Guam and landed back at Guam. This was taken from a camera, not a video camera, but a still camera that was, uh, that's on the, one of our wing pods. So it's a bit choppy. I think I, uh, it's a couple of frames per second, but then it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it lasts just a few minutes. So anyway, it's pretty cool. We're about 45,000 feet here. We're gonna go down to 500 feet. We're sampling all the time, gathering the data that Christina or the other scientists want. And um, then we'll climb back to 49,000 feet before we recover to Guam. And once we get down to the 500 foot level here, Truck Lagoon is just, uh, just off to the right. 
So this is why we do all the hard work in order to be able to do this and work with air traffic control folks there. And this is basically the way we uh, have a successful field campaign. Now we're going to turn toward uh, toward Guam. I did the landing on this one, so I thought it was pretty important to show that. So when somebody mentions flight operations, I bet immediately what comes into everybody's minds are aircraft. And that is the pointy end of the spear, certainly for, uh, for what we do and for what Christina and the other scientists do. But, and it is by far the best part, but really we spend an awful lot of time in the books. We have check rides to do. We study the aircraft manuals. We have new avionics in both of the aircraft that are super, computers for the aviation industry that we have to study up on all the time uh, were checked with the, uh, the, the uh, General Services Administration from the uh, U.S. government comes in and inspects us. And um, just a, a lot of legwork goes into it. It's just not as easy as hopping in, the, in an airplane and cranking it up and taking off and then coming back and flying. We do put a lot of, a lot of work into our certifications and to ensure that the science uh, folks in the back are safe when they fly with us. This is a low approach at Greeley in the C-130. This aircraft is, uh, the, both of our aircraft are, are too heavy to fly uh, lower than a thousand feet. So when the scientists want to sample um, the air, we, below a thousand feet, we have to do low approaches at all these airports. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we work so closely with air traffic control. This is an interesting video here. This is several years old. This shows you the air traffic uh, worldwide airflow from about 2015, I believe. And if you notice, all these yellow dots, they're aircraft. And those aircraft are going from point A to point B. They've got passengers that want to get there as quickly as they can and as direct as they can. And then they've got their companies, the airlines, that want to get there as, as efficiently as they can. And then here we come. All those airplanes going to point A to point B out there. This is the track from us. Our aircraft is the green track and the red track is a NASA aircraft. We did a thunderstorm study over the Midwest uh, several years ago. So when we come in and do this, we completely disrupt ATC. So one of our big jobs, when Christina comes to us with an idea for a project, we take a look at it. We take a look at the airspace. And then one of the first things we do is reach out to our contacts in the air traffic control. In the United States, we are, pretty much on a first name basis with the front with some of the managers uh, at Denver Approach and Denver Center. For overseas flights, international flights, we actually make the time to go and visit those countries and we brief their air traffic control supervisory staff uh, in person to make sure that we can do what it is that we want to do. And what it really works out to be is it's a huge balancing act. We understand how important research is. The air traffic control people may not, may not agree with that. So we try to be as transparent as possible to them and we can take delays and we can take radar vectors, but the big goal is to be able to get Christina the data that, that she needs. And these field projects are hugely expensive and it's just a, a complete waste if we go out there and, uh, and we can't do what it is that Christina wants us to do. But again, air traffic control, they have a different perspective. They wanna get airplanes from point A to point B. And I can tell you this, we have never been cleared to do whatever we want to do. And it, uh, invoking the science work doesn't usually work either. So it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of briefing to do that. 12 to 24 months prior, we start working with the scientists. We take a look at logistics, performance, risk identification and, and management, and then again, airspace. Airspace is a big one for us. For airport logistics, you just can't take an airplane off and fly it 3,500 nautical miles away and then land and expect it to operate 
without some kind of tender loving care over a six week period. So we take a look at, at shipping to get it in there. We take a look at parking, you know, the, um, we've got the 132 foot wingspans on the C-130. So a lot of times you can't go into these smaller airports um, because they don't have parking. Uh, weight bearing capacity is a, is a huge one. The C-130 weighs 155,000 pounds and the G-5 weighs 90,000 pounds. We have to make sure that not only the runways can take us, we certainly don't want to crater the runways and, and, and damage runways when we go to these places, but taxiways as well. We need to really, really work closely with the local um, air traffic control people there. Runway length is a big one. We oftentimes are not able to go to big uh, international airports. Number one, they've got flow control problems and it's very difficult to work out of uh, to be able to get off if, for, if you're a general aviation aircraft like us. So when we go to these smaller, more rural areas, we have to be careful of runway length. Airplanes need uh, a certain amount of runway to take off on and that depends on your gross weight. If you don't have enough runway length, you're not gonna be able to put as much fuel on, so I can't be airborne or we can't be airborne as long as the scientists would like us to, to uh, for the data collection. Some of the other smaller airports, they may not have the fueling capacity to put 50,000 pounds, 7,500 gallons of fuel on an airplane. So we have to look at that as well. And then for winter operations, we prefer hangars. Um, our aircraft cannot be de-iced. I'm sure all of you have been on commercial airplanes taking off out of Denver in the wintertime, and you'll see the big de-icing trucks that'll pull up and de-ice the wings. We can't do that with our aircraft because then that would contaminate the instruments that we've got and the inlets that we have. So we have to be very careful about that. So a hangar is critical for winter operations. Aircraft performance is a big one. The more weight we put on the aircraft is equals less fuel, which means that I can not be airborne as long as what we need to be. So there's a balance there. Also, we can't, we have to worry about obstacles to avoid. Any aircraft that takes any multi-engine that the aircraft that takes off, we have to make sure that we have the proper weight to be able to lose an engine and they'll still climb out and clear any obstacles in our path. What that means sometimes, or many times, if, is that we have to defuel, uh, we have to take fuel off the aircraft or we can't carry as much payload. The scientific payload, it's not like we've got a pallet that we can take off, so we end up uh, having to reduce the fuel. That comes into play at high altitude airports like Denver, the Denver area, or either really hot, uh, uh, hot areas in the world as well. Another thing that we have to worry about with aircraft performance is our wings. So the Gulf Stream 5 in particular, that aircraft is made to climb high and go a long way and stay airborne a long time, 12 hours or so, with a very, very clean aerodynamic wing. When we start loading our wings up with these pods, this is a big radar pod, and then we have other pods with scientific instruments in there, that causes a lot of drag for us. So we have to figure out that drag for fuel burns. When we're flying down over the Southern Ocean, we don't have an alternate. We have to make it all the way back to Tasmania if something, you know, if something goes wrong. So our fuel burns are really critical for us. So we spend a lot of time um, analyzing fuel burns to see how far south we can get or how far north we can get depending on where we're flying. So hazard ID and risk mitigation is a big, big, big deal for us. But when you think about it, we all do that. When you get in your car after a snowstorm and go to the grocery store, you mitigate risk by having snow tires uh, on or either just you, you don't drive as fast, at least I hope so. So we take it to another level because our risks are multifaceted. You know, if we're flying around weather, convection, that's, you know, that's a big one. Icing. When Christina was talking about flying the icing clouds with that down south, that's also a big one. Our aircraft are certified up to severe icing. Once we get into severe icing, or like the water bottle that the Nalgene bottle that Christina was shaking, that super cool liquid water. When those droplets hit our wings, then that would that causes ice on the wings, and that's oftentimes severe um, icing. Turbulence is a big deal. The aircraft is only designed to be able to take so much. Wind shear is obviously a problem for takeoff and landing if we're, if we're in an area with high convection or like in Puta Arenas when we're down there doing an ice bridge or a uh, Antarctic uh, mapping flight, 
um, and the mountains were there and it was super windy, we, we would have wind shear alerts all the time. So we try, to, we try to study ahead for that and we understand those areas that we're coming into uh, before we ever get there. Air traffic, that's, you know, we've already covered that. When we fly low level operations, and we'll fly the aircraft down to 100 feet over the water, and the mountains will fly down to 1,000 feet. Low approaches, we're going down to 50 feet. So we always make sure that we have the proper performance for that. Same as mountainous terrain. Extreme temperatures, the hotter it gets, the less fuel we can put on. So that's another consideration that we have to, that we have to look for and understand before we get there. And then finally, fatigue can be a big factor. Um, when you're flying multiple nine hour days, flying days, nine hours, which equates to about 14 hour days, you do several of those back to back, you get tired. So we really have to monitor that, not only for the pilots, but also for the folks in the back of the airplane that they're flying with us, because they're not passengers. You know, they're, they're uh, almost crew members. And by the way, that's not our aircraft. That's just a stock plane that we, uh, that I just cut off the, uh, off the internet. We've already talked some about ATC. I thought this was a, a decent picture that uh, illustrates the point of congestion. This is taken from our flight planning program and all of those green lines are airways. All those areas are like highways in the sky. So when we did a, um, an East Coast, when we do an East Coast project, we take a look and we'll brief, I don't know, 10 or 12 different air traffic control facilities to try to figure out how we'll be able to get up and get down and around all the, uh, all that airspace. Busy airports, heavy traffic areas, there's a lot of military airspace out there. We don't have permission to fly in the military restricted areas, so we have to figure out the best way to be able to get through there. Do we have to go up, find a corridor, and then get out past the, uh, the restricted areas? You know, we're just looking at a, lot of, at a lot of stuff. And then finally, internationally. It's challenging to fly international just going from point A to point B, and it's even more challenging to be able to fly internationally and then ask them, hey, we want to stop at 41,000 feet and spiral down to 500 feet and then climb back up to 41,000 feet. So it's, it's, it's a, it takes a lot of work, but I think we've been pretty successful. And um, to be able to get the science people what it is that they need. So now we're ready to fly. But before we get to the flight part, I'm going to turn it over uh, back over to Christina. And then I'll finish up with some with some G Wiz pictures. I think I stopped sharing. Thank you, Scotty. And let's see. Okay, so um, thank you for that introduction to our awesome aircraft and. Um, you know, there's a, a lot that goes into it. And like I said, this is such a collaborative field and that's one of the biggest joys of, of being part of it. Um, and so I'm gonna talk more about the Southern Ocean field campaign. And so here's another um, video for you now looking over the Southern Ocean. Um, and so really the focus is of my research has been to use the data from the Socrates campaign that we collected and use those to characterize the abundance of these special ice depleting particles that we talked about earlier and also the phase of clouds of the Southern Ocean, and to then use those data to evaluate and improve the clouds that are in our numerical models. And I love this video because it, it, it's like the, the living proof of the cloudiness of the Southern Ocean. You can, it's sort of mesmerizing. You can probably stare at it for, for a long time. Um, and before I go much further, I do want to acknowledge that um, these projects include contributions from many different universities and organizations. And so this is likely not an exhaustive list, but this is um, some of the key people that I'm working with um, in this research um, from all over the world, um, including, you know, Karlsruhe Institute for Technology in Germany, um, Australian government, um, and the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, um, along with many U.S. universities. And so um, I just want to point out that this is not something that um, NCAR is alone in. Um, it, takes a, uh, it takes a lot of people. Um, for Socrates, we were based out of Hobart, Tasmania, so people who uh, maybe haven't been to that part of the world before, um, that's um, at the very southern point of Australia, um, off of their, um, off of Tasmania. And we did a total of 15 flights during this field campaign over the course of two months. Um, as Scotty mentioned, our main 
um, object our main concerns for flights were um, high winds and also the icing. Um, and so those were our main constraints. And you can see that we were able to do pretty simple flight paths. Um, the proposed flight plan for Socrates looked something like this. Um, this was written in our proposal. Um, and um, we would leave Hobart and we would do what's called a ferry leg where we would fly as far south um, as we were gonna go that day. Um, we then would descend down to the cloud layer and we would sample clouds. We would also even rendezvous with, um, we had a ship-based campaign um, on the RV investigator that belongs to Australia. Um, and then we also would overpass um, some ground-based measurements um, over this um, um, Macquarie Island. And so again, focusing on that idea that we're really trying to pull together multiple measurements to be able to get a full picture. And um, along with the, the planning that goes into field campaigns, you also have to kind of um, loosen your expectations when you're in the field because you have to be very, um, you have to adapt very quickly. And sometimes instruments need specific needs. And so a lot of times our flight plans would actually look like this, um, where we would gather, you know, a memo, a memo pad from the hotel and make um, our flight plan. And so, flight plan. And so in this case, you know, we still had our ferry leg, we did our above cloud leg, in cloud leg, below cloud leg. So this allows us to get a lot of statistics on the particles that are surrounding the cloud and also the particles within the cloud. And then also doing our, our profiles, the sawtooth profile maneuvers. And we would repeat this until Scotty or whoever was flying the plane told us that our research fuel was done for the day. And so then we would head back to Hobart. Um, I really like this image, so you may be very confused at first, but if you imagine when you book a flight for United or, or whatever airline that you would fly on and you would go on and pick your seat, um, this is kind of that same, this is the exact same um, viewpoint. So it's the cross section of the belly of the plane. Um, these yellow points here, these are the, where the crew members would sit. Um, and so a total, we were on the G5 and a total of six um, crew members were, um, were in the back. Um, the rest of the space was taken up by instruments. So we have atmospheric particles being measured. We also measured our ice nucleating particles and other measurements of atmospheric and cloud particles. And we also had um, remote sensing measurements like radar and LIDAR. And so all of these, measure, all these measurements are being managed by the crew members and even people down on the ground. Um, some more pictures from the, the flight. Um, these are um, themed as the cloud measurements. Um, so we have um, Cindy Chui, a scientist here, operating multiple instruments looking at both cloud and aerosol particles. Um, we have these different cloud probes that Scotty was referring to. These actually are able to image cloud, um, cloud particles, so in this case, ice crystals and liquid cloud droplets. And that gives us information of the cloud phase um, and even the presence of precipitation and whatnot. So that gives us a really in-depth view of the clouds themselves. Okay, so measuring ice nucleating particles. I'm going to describe this one because this one was actually my baby whenever I was a, um, a graduate student with Paul DeMont at Colorado State University. This is the continuous flow diffusion chamber, and this is the viewpoint from my position on the aircraft, um, and you can actually, there's another window, so I was able actually to see out the window, um, but you can see that it's a little bit chaotic, and so I'll show you a, a schematic of what this chamber does. And so we're able to pull the atmospheric particles from the chamber. So we have an inlet that's on the wing of the plane or the belly of the plane, and we're able to pull those atmospheric particles into our chamber. And that chamber, we have full control over the amount of water vapor and the temperatures that are within that chamber. And so we're able to actually form a mixed phase cloud. So this is where those atmospheric particles can form the super cold liquid cloud droplets, or if it's a special ice nucleating particle, it will form an ice crystal. And then we take advantage of the difference between those cloud droplets and those ice crystals, and we actually evaporate the cloud droplets and allow those cr um, crystals to, to make it all the way to the base of the chamber. And finally, we count and characterize the particles that come out of the base of this cloud chamber and we are able to identify the number of aerosol particles and the number of cloud, um, cloud ice particles. And from this, we're able to actually detect the number of ice nucleating particles in the atmosphere at a given time and location. And what's so special about this is that this is the first time that airborne measurements of ice nucleating particles have actually been made over the Southern Ocean. And so, as I mentioned, the Southern Ocean is not only important, but it's also really poorly, um, there's not a lot of observations there. So this was a really exciting project to be a part of. Um, and what we found was that the concentration of ice nucleating particles are extremely low over the Southern Ocean. 
And what I mean by that is over the Southern Ocean, if you were to take a liter of air, so say you have a Nalgene, um, if you take a liter of air, you would see less than one, so less than even 0.1, isolating particle in that liter of air. If you collected a liter of air over the continental US instead, you would have anywhere from one to 100, even 1,000 isolating particles per liter of air at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So this is a really big difference in that over the Southern Ocean, you have far fewer particles that are allowed, are able to make um, ice crystals in the clouds. And what's so profound about this finding and that we have this data to really back up um, that this is true is that now we can take that back to our models and we can actually start implementing these observed features in our community earth system model. And so what I'm going to show are some results of that effort. Um, and so in our old configuration of the model, um, which was a version from about a year or two ago, um, we would have essentially the same number of isolated particles no matter where you are in the world. So in our example of continental US versus Southern Ocean, we would have one to 100 isolating particles per liter of air. And what I mean by that is that the, the amount of ice nucleation taking place in mixed phase clouds was equivalent in both locations. Whereas in the new configuration, now we're actually able to see a contrast. So in the new configuration, we're still able to have those higher number concentrations of isolated particles over the continental US or places similar. And then now we have far fewer isolated particles over the Southern Ocean. And this is because now the model is taking into account not only the type of, ice, of um, aerosol particles that are present in the model, but also the type and whether or not they are proper and can serve as isolating particles. So this is a big advancement motivated by these findings. And so I'm gonna show some results from simulated Southern Ocean mixed phase clouds. Um, and the way I'm going to depict this is by showing the fraction of clouds as a function of temperature that are either liquid or ice. And what we see is in our old configuration, we can see that the liquid clouds dominate at this warmer temperature, but they qu quickly glaciate to where the Southern Ocean clouds are dominated by this ice phase. When we make this change to now include our new, semi, our new configuration that takes into account the differences based on where you are, how many particles are around, and whether or not they serve as ice nucleating particles, we can see that the model now produces more liquid clouds. We have higher amounts of the blue now, these warmer temperatures, and we also have less ice clouds in the model clouds. And so this is a success in that we were able to change um, something in the model and we got the expected um, response from the model. And now what we're working on is because we have these new, um, uh, these new measurements from Socrates, we're actually able to make more direct comparisons of the model clouds and observed clouds. And this is really the truth that we need to actually evaluate the model. And this is, I think, really evident in this comparison where I'm showing from the Socrates campaign, you know, all the different flights that we had, the different phases that were present at different temperatures. And so you can see that liquid phase dominates down to about minus 18 degrees Celsius. And then there's a shift down at these colder temperatures where now we have mostly ice clouds. And that's what was, what was observed during Socrates. And so then what we did is we um, simulated the Socrates flight path through the model. And we were able to collect data in the model that corresponds with same location and time as Socrates. And what we do, when we do that, we can see that our comparison now um, indicates that our model actually produces too much liquid in our model clouds. And that's where we have very little ice, um, in fact, negligent amounts of ice, um, all the way throughout the entire mixed phase temperature range and liquid clouds are present throughout when that's contrasting to our ob observations. And so there's still a lot of work to be done and that's what me and my colleagues are currently working on. And to kind of show just how complex this is and why um, it, it really takes many measurements and a lot of data and a lot of um, effort is that it's more than just ice nucleation, right? Clouds are complicated. And so what I'm, what I'm showing here is the one process that we've focused on where ice, nu um, ice nucleating particles are in this case, ice, nucle ice nuclei, IN. Um, the aerosol can influence cloud ice through nucleation or freezing. Um, but when we zoom out and look at the whole ice microphysics scheme, it's very daunting. And you can see that aerosols can also influence cloud droplets. And these cloud droplets and ice crystals then also interact with snow, hail, grapple, rain, 
water vapor, and all these different processes that are listed here all play a role in governing how that cloud changes from a liquid to an ice um, cloud and how precipitation forms and how long that cloud will last. Um, and so there's a lot of work going into um, taking the observations from Socrates and making informed decisions on how we can further develop the model. And so I wanted to give you guys two take home messages. Really, I really hope that more than anything, you never look at a cloud the same. I hope that you can understand from this that clouds are very complex and also appreciate their importance, not only in giving us rain, snow or not, but also in how they may modulate our climate. And the second thing is I want to emphasize that collaborative atmospheric and airborne research in particular really does push our knowledge of our Earth system forward. So in order for us to continue to develop a, a, a true and um, good representation of the Earth system in our models, we really need these um, checks based on our airborne research and our field observations to be able to push that forward. And we really can't do that without those observations. Um, and so um, I just want to be an advocate for that. Um, and finally, I, I hope that you've been inspired in some way to just learn more about, about um, earth science because it's really awesome. And so if you need one more thing to be impressed by, I will pass it back to Scotty, who's going to give us some um, additional videos and images. Thanks, Christina. Okay, so now that you've been able to see what goes along with putting a field project together and how we actually fly a field project, I've just got a series of G Wiz photographs taken over the uh, 10 years or so, or 12 years or so that I've been here. We were flying with a NASA P3 and they came up on our wing. We fly close with other aircraft that are doing research because we want to do instrument intercomparisons. It's very complicated to be able to take temperature and pressure readings from an aircraft with the probes that Christina was telling you about. So we got to make sure that our algorithms will um, compensate to give accurate data, but we're not sure that it's accurate until we actually go up and, and fly close to another airplane. So that gives us a big advantage when we can fly close and then uh, the scientists can, can um, compare the instrumentation and then figure out what needs to happen from there. So remember when I was talking about fatigue? Here's some sunrise shots for you. This is out over the uh, Atlantic when we were doing a winter study over there. Uh, one one uh, morning, the sun was just rising. There's another sunrise shot for you in the C-130. Then this is actually a uh, sunset shot when we were going into Chile when we were making our way down to Punta Arenas for the um, ice bridge flight where we, were, we had a, a, a NASA instrument on and we were actually trying to measure ice thickness down through there through Antarctica. More C-130 pictures. Um, and this is actually another sunrise picture. So we did a lot of sunrises for that project. This is over Atlanta, Georgia at 3 a.m. And when we talked to the air traffic control folks and they and we want to do a low approach over major airports like Atlanta, Hartsville, three o'clock in the morning is the best time to do it, unfortunately for us, but fortunately for the air traffic control people. And another C-130 shot coming in and landing at uh, Rocky Mountain Metro. So the um, top picture here, hold on just a second. There it goes, okay. I didn't have this, the uh, slideshow going. Anyway, the top picture, that's off the coast of Antarctica. We actually rendezvoused with a research ship, one much like the one that uh, Christina was talking about. We went down to 100 feet for that one. And uh, actually a person in the mast of the ship took a picture of that. The bottom one is a C-130 coming back into uh, Tennessee where we're doing a uh, big study up and down the Ohio River Valley over in that part of the, uh, of the U.S. This is the ship that we rendezvoused with and we were just making a circle. We cruised overhead about 45,000 feet and we just did a, a big circle and then we came back alongside. Again, that's for instrument comparison. That ship had instruments on there. We wanted to get down close to them so we could see if our readings were, uh, matched what the ship's readings were. And the bottom picture is again off the coast of Antarctica. 
Those are icebergs that, are ha that have actually popped up through the ice. And we're in a uh, 40 degree bank turn or so, so the wing is actually pouring down in that picture. Another C-130 shot. This is departing Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport, our home airport there in Broomfield. And uh, that's heading up into the mountains. We're actually flying visual flight rules at the time, which is the most fun. We were doing a uh, pollution study, I believe if I remember right, and we we're just gonna hop right over the mountain and get down the valley on the other side. That's the actual, actually the most fun flying is when you can just do visual flight rules. This is probably one of my favorite photographs. We did a CSET project. We were flying between um, Sacramento, California and Hawaii. We did that for a, about a month and we never got above 20,000 feet. We spent a lot of time at 500 feet and we were, we popped out or looked back and uh, one of the scientists actually took that picture for us and caught the nice rainbow with a wing in it. So we did an eclipse flight in 2019. We actually uh, recovered to Easter Island and this is a few second video sped up again with the wing uh, pods on there. The Eclipse, when you're at, we were at 47,000 feet, we actually had a Chilean 787 um, out on our side and below us. The, the eclipses at that altitude aren't nearly as dramatic as they are on the ground, especially when they are total eclipses. In uh, 2010, and then again, I think in 2014, we did a thunderstorm sprite study. Sprites is where there is energy that's coming up out of the top of the thunderstorms. They're invisible to the naked eye. So we were flying about 150 kilometers circling these thunderstorms and we had a big high-speed camera um, off the left, um, one of the left windows, one of the viewports, and we actually were able to catch a couple of these. You can't see that with your, with your eyes, but they're pretty, pretty cool. And here's a color shot of what one looks like. And finally, the research is over and it's time to land. So thank you very much for having us. We've certainly enjoyed it. And I think we've got time for some questions now, right, Justin? We sure do. And we've got some coming in from Facebook now. Um, let's see. Hazel wonders if there's any influence of the diminished upper atmospheric ozone layer in this model, in your model, or is that factor not important? Uh, I'm most certain that that factor is important for representing the Earth climate system. Um, what's, so that is represented in most, in all versions of the model. Um, we, in particular, are not focused on the timescales in which that would actually impact because we're looking at like daily um, or, or up to monthly timescales. And so um, good question. And that is important for that part of the region in terms of the climate. Um, but for our particular questions um, for these low level clouds, um, it doesn't have a big influence. And Alex is saying, uh, hey, Christina, this is so great. Thanks for the heads up. Uh, what happened to climate sensitivity when you made the changes in the model based on Socrates' data? Okay, so I don't know. I don't know which Alex this is, but Alex uh, Lubbin. What's that? Oh, awesome! Um, uh, hi, Alex. Um, so, climate sensitivity for those for those who are uh, maybe not familiar is how we sort of tune our models. Um, so, there are multiple climate models um, from different institutes. And the climate sensitivity is basically how much your model responds to some sort of forcing. And in many cases, the forcing is doubling CO2. So you, you, you slam a bunch more CO2 into your model and look and see how much does the global temperature increase. And we compare that through different models. And that's sort of like a calibration um, and some indication of how sensitive the Earth system is to some forcing, in this case, CO2. Um, and so to answer Alex's question, when we change the Southern Ocean clouds, we actually have an increase and our climate sensitivity. And what happens is, I was unable to get to that in this talk, but the ice clouds that are current in the old version of the model, there's a lot of ice clouds in the Southern Ocean. And those ice clouds, when there's warming, cause a feedback where the ice clouds are no longer able to form. They form liquid clouds instead. 
And so as I demonstrated, the liquid clouds actually can stay around for much longer and that reflects more sunlight back to light, uh, back to space. So when we, when we fixed our Southern Ocean clouds to contain more liquid, that cloud phase feedback actually disappears and so, or, or is reduced. So we have far less ice to begin with, which means that there's less of a change in the phase and the amount of liquid that happens in 150, 200 years. Um, and so we do have big changes in our climate sensitivity because of that. And Scott is interested to know if he heard you right and you still use Fortran. We do. <laughs> we use it for um, like analysis and things. We we have more progressive uh, um, analysis tools. Like Py like I use Python personally, but and other people use um, MATLAB. Um, so Fortran, though, is what the model has been developed in and, and is, is the, the language of our model. Trevor says, great presentation, really interesting. Wondering if Scott can talk about his aviation background prior to joining NCAR. Sure, I'll be glad to. So I spent uh, 26 years in the, in the Air Force. I flew C-130s and Gulfstreams. Uh, with the Air Force, and I've always wanted to fly. I always had an interest in it, and uh, the Air Force just worked out for me. So uh, I really enjoyed it. I actually went into the Air Force with the whole goal of spending six years in, and then when we had Delta Airlines pilot. But uh, I just I had so much fun. I kept uh, just stayed in 26 years. So and this job, uh, there's only four pilots here. I think that this is probably the best aviation job in the world. It's a lot of fun. It's not just point A to point B. It's a lot of work, but you know, it's, it, it is a lot of fun. We get to fly a lot of different regimes. Well, I'm not seeing more questions come in. Oh, yes, we do. Yeah, we do. We have one from Hazel uh, for Scott. Uh, when you mentioned the effects of fatigue, I thought of mental fatigue. What is the general lifetime of, or mileage limits of your aircraft due to aging of their metals? Or metal fatigue? Oh, I thought you meant mental. What is the general lifetime of mileage limits of your aircraft due to aging of their metals? Well, you know, some of the older aircraft actually had a, a, a service lifespan. The newer aircraft, they don't. The Gulfstream doesn't. As the aircraft age, inspections will go up. But the aircraft are checked so many times and, and hardly anything, everything's changed over time. So eventually that will come to fruition. But like with our C-130 aircraft, we fly a lot of low level with it. So we have a multiplier effect for our hours. So if we fly one hour, it's like uh, flying equivalent of three hours on the Gulf Stream. And we have maintenance programs that account for that. And both of our aircraft are maintaining the, the C-130 to a Lockheed program and the G-5 to a a Gulfstream program. My colleague Marika at the city says, great presentation. Nice to see some former NCAR colleagues. Her question is, how has COVID impacted ops and missions? Well, um, COVID has certainly impacted our operations this year. As a matter of fact, uh, most of our field campaigns have slipped the next year. We have flown, we are flying a small test program with uh, University of Wyoming as uh, collaborators for that. And we flew a test program back before COVID, but our Korea, Japan big trip um, got pushed back to 2021. So it's, it's affected us, but I have to say this, that, you know, in UCAR, NCAR and the National Science Foundation, I think that they've done a marvelous job um, with the protocols that they have in place to allow us to come back in. We've flown uh, pilot proficiency flights and we've traveled with simulators and everything, but we've done it in a, safe, in a safe manner that was in accordance with all the protocols that UCARS put out. Um, we have, they've kept us current and um, proficient because we had a NASA backup mission in case their Gulfstream go, went down for maintenance and we would step in and fly some of the hurricane flights for them. So COVID's definitely impacted us, and I am really, we are all really ready to get over this and start flying research again. It looks like 2021 and 2022 is going to be quite busy for us, which is a good thing. We are playing catch up some, 
but definitely it's uh, it's impacted us. Well, that looks like it's about it for questions. Uh, I want to thank you both for joining us. We're we're so thrilled to be partnering with NCAR uh, to deliver these programs, um, and we look forward to doing more in the future. Um, really, keep up the great work, and thanks for spending some time with us on a Thursday evening and late fall. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of thank course. you, Justin. You're welcome anytime. Um, see some of you next week. Tune in next week for a great conversation with our curator of history, Eric Mason, on his new book, Longmont 150, which ships next week. That's right. You can get a copy of your very own through the museum if you're interested. Um, thanks again, you two. See you soon and see you all next week. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.